Start basketball. Hi, this is Coach Steve Moore, and you're listening to the Hoop Heads Podcast. Hey, Hoop Heads. Wanted to take a minute to shout out our partners and friends at Dr. Dish Basketball. Their Dr. Dish shooting machines are undoubtedly the most advanced and user friendly machines on the market, and they truly accelerate skill development faster than ever. Learn more at drdishbasketball.com and follow their incredible content at Dr. Dish B-Ball on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Mention the Hoop Heads podcast and save an extra $300 on the Dr. Dish Rebel, All-Star, and CT models. Also, make sure to check out the new Dr. Dish Home Machine, which is perfect for these crazy times when gyms and schools are closed. Visit drdishbasketball.com for details. That's a great deal, Hoop Heads. Get your Dr. Dish shooting machine today. Everyday guys to me are, you're going to have great days, you're going to have bad days, you're going to have days in between, but that doesn't change how you are. Pat Baldwin just completed his third season as the head coach at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. In his first season on the bench, he led the Panthers to 16 victories, an improvement of five wins over the prior season while also finishing four spots higher in the final Horizon League regular season standings. A key member of the Northwestern coaching staff under head coach Chris Collins, Baldwin spent four seasons as an assistant coach at Northwestern, helping rebuild his alma mater into a force in the Big Ten. Pat got his coaching start at Division II Lincoln University in Jefferson City, Missouri, during the 2001-2002 season. From there, he coached at UW-Green Bay, Loyola of Chicago, and Missouri State before returning to Northwestern. After graduating from Northwestern, Baldwin spent three years as a business analyst at Dean Foods in Rosemont, Illinois, before playing professional basketball in Bosnia and Croatia from 1999 to 2001. Baldwin was a standout player for Northwestern from 1990 to 1994. He ranks first in school history with 272 career steals, his second all-time with 452 assists, and 20th with 1,189 points. After you're finished listening to the show, Hop over to iTunes and leave us a five-star rating and review to help others in the basketball community find the Hoop Heads podcast. If you haven't told a friend or coaching colleague about the show, what are you waiting for? Tell them to subscribe now on their favorite podcast app so they never miss an episode. You can find all the show notes plus every episode we've ever recorded on our website, hoopheadspod.com. Get your notebook and grab a pen so you can take some notes as you listen to this episode with Coach Pat Baldwin from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Hello and welcome to the Hoop Heads Podcast. It's Mike Cleansing here this morning without my co-host Jason Sunkel, but I am here with Coach Pat Baldwin from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Pat, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. I appreciate being on. We are excited to have you on, dig into all the things that you've been able to do in the game, both as a player and as a coach, and want to go back in time to when you were a kid and just talk a little bit about how you fell in love with the game of basketball when you were younger. You know, that was... Seems like a long time ago, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I can relate to that. <laughs> you know, when I when I was a kid, I was pretty fortunate to to have. I, I was the youngest of seven in my family, so you know, I had three brothers and three sisters, and and they were all in the game and and all very active and and just sports in general. And in our town, you know, our high school team and and kids, we had kids all around our neighborhood. I had a park too you know, two blocks away from me. And, uh, you know, so that was pretty easy to to fall in love with the game. And, you know, so from the time I can remember, I had a ball in my hand, you know, my, uh, you know, my gym teacher at the time, Robert Strano, Bob Strano, he since had passed away. Uh, he had a picture of me at uh, on a playground, you know, with three balls in my hand, not sharing with anybody. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so he, so that kind of, you know, that picture kind of summarized what, what either any type of ball meant to me, but particularly basketball. And uh, so, you know, I, I got involved at, at an early age and just playing, watching my brothers and sisters play. You know, my, my sister was a, a really good, uh, my oldest sister was a really good basketball player. She played 
uh, multiple sports. And, you know, she, you know, watching her, you know, a lot of it, uh, you know, drew me to the game. And then, you know, one of my brothers, uh, my second oldest brother, he played on the high school team and, and he was probably the most athletic out of all of us. Uh, he had four two forty speed and and uh, had some tryouts with the with the Royals and and all of that. But he also played and and I used to just love when I was little, just going to his practices, going to the high school games. I can remember and recall when I was, you know, I would stand underneath the uh, underneath the basket during layup lines. And I could just feel the guys when they did their layups, just the wind passing by me, you know, just how <laughs> quick they were. Yep. You know, I always, I always thought about those little times when I, uh, little things when I grew up, and and how enthralled I was. And uh, so, you know, fast forwarding a little bit into, you know, when I got to, you know, probably third, third grade, um, it, it just became an obsession with me, um, where I had to be at the gym. I couldn't miss any games. You know, I, I wanted to be in every single play. Uh, my brother, Dwayne, he would tell you that uh, there was a time that 50 points was was kind of the, the point total you wanted to get in the middle school uh, games that we played on Saturdays at Nettie Hartman. And there was a time that, you know, we were getting close. We were kind of like at 45 points. Then we scored 46 and then we scored 48. And then someone missed a free throw. We got to 49 points and the coach told us to hold the ball. <laughs> so after that, <laughs> and I and I just was crying on the bench. I went home. I was crying. You couldn't, you know, you couldn't console me. You know, I wanted to get that benchmark of, of fifty points, uh, you know, for our team. And uh, maybe it was a lesson by the coach just to be <laughs> humble and 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 have some humility. But uh, but that was great. And then you know, I, I think the trajectory of my basketball career kind of changed in fifth grade when I started playing AAU. A, a very good teammate of mine and friend of mine uh, to this day, Todd Knoll, uh, his family was playing, you know, someone, someone had introduced AAU to him. And at that time, it was it was really statewide AAU. It wasn't the national thing that we know now. Um, and then you go to the nationals in, in different parts. And, um, you know, so I was introduced at fifth grade to AAU basketball and you know, the team was out of Atchison, Kansas. Uh, George Ross was was the head coach. And and uh, I just thought it was tremendous just the the opportunity to to get a chance to to play and travel a little bit. My first travel AAU game was in Des Moines, Iowa, uh, you know, and I'm from Kansas City. So uh, playing in Des Moines, Iowa for the Nationals and, and we played a team out of Potomac Valley um, in Maryland and uh, and uh, there were a number of teams that we played, but I remember that game specifically because it, it introduced me to big time basketball, in my opinion, at that age, because they were pressing us. They were trapping us. They were getting layups and steals. So, uh, you know, that that made me, you know, really hungry to get better. And uh, and then my high school team was good. You know, we went on into, or I'm sorry, my junior high school team. Uh, we only lost two games in my three years in junior high. They didn't have uh, ninth grade at the high school that time. We were seven through nine. Uh, we were pretty good. Uh, went undefeated my my freshman year, and and uh, and then going into the high school uh, was was really fun because all the years of watching my brothers and sisters play and participate and and doing all that stuff, it just it was just a dream come true to be able to play high school basketball uh, for my high school and wear the wear the blue and white and and be a pioneer. Uh, it was, it was, it, it's nostalgic even talking about it today. You know, I'm getting goosebumps. Yeah, that's awesome. There's two things I wanted to ask you about here. So one is what you just described, I think is such a huge part of having a successful high school, high school program. And that is, you know, I heard you start from the time that you were a little kid early in elementary school and clearly you had siblings that were on the team, but regardless I think that when you can set up that aspirational situation where kids who are seven, eight, nine years old are coming to those high school games and looking at those kids who are on that team and saying, man, I can't wait till one day I get to put that jersey on, or I can't wait until one day I get to play for that coach, or I can't wait till one day that I can run out of the tunnel and hear the fight song. To me, that's such a huge part of building a high school program. And so it's 
again, I, I feel the same way. Like my experience was very similar to yours from a standpoint of when I was in elementary school, I remember I tell people this all the time. The one thing that I always thought was the coolest thing was to watch the high school kids come out and slap the backboard on their layups during warmups. Like I thought that was like the greatest thing. Yeah, like, yeah. man, I cannot wait until I can go out there in warmups and just slap the glass on this, in this layup line. And so it was funny when you said, you know, you could feel the wind of the players, you know, coming past you when you're standing underneath the basket. I can completely, completely relate to that. So that's one piece of it. And the second thing I wanted to ask you about is, you know, you talked about when you were little and obviously with lots of brothers and sisters and you're playing and you're, you're outside doing all those things. Were you at any point a multi-sport athlete during high school or at what point did you kind of drop those other sports if, if you did and just focus on basketball? Yeah, it's funny that you say that, you know, I, I go back to, you know, what my dad would always say to, to all of us is, you know, he would always tell me not to put all your eggs in one basket and, and he was talking about, you know, sports and, and all of that stuff. And, you know, I played, I played baseball, I played football. Uh, my dad would always say, quiet is kept. He's, he's pretty a good soccer player too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I played soccer when I was younger and, and uh, was on a travel soccer team as a goalie. So, you know, I, I played all the sports and wanted to do every single one of them. I love Bo Jackson and Deion Sanders and those guys who, who played multiple sports as well. And, and, uh, you know, so my dad always wanted me to keep my options open, you know, with that stuff. And, and uh, going into high school, um, I didn't think about, um, you know, honestly, I didn't think about specializing in one thing or another. The seasons, when the seasons change, that means that you're in a different sport. That's what I thought about. So, but with AAU, I started playing AAU a lot, even more, and it became, you know, much bigger as I got into high school. And with spring was usually baseball for me. And I found myself missing baseball for AAU tournaments. And that was really a conflict for me because I, I love baseball. I loved, I loved, you know, pitching and catching and doing all that stuff and hitting and being a part of that. And, um, and then when I got to my, my junior year and I was still playing football at the time as well as a quarterback, when I got to my junior year, uh, you know, I had an injury towards the tail end of my junior year in football. It wasn't huge, but it was something that scared me. And my passion was with basketball because I grew up with, a, with you know, you can do basketball at any point, whether it was outside, inside. We were able to get to the gyms. I used to go to watch my dad referee and do all that stuff. So you could play it at, at any time of the year. Baseball was tough to do that. Football was tough to do that unless you just threw the football inside. So I had a passion for basketball. And when I got the, when I had that injury and, uh, you know, that really kind of made me think that that uh, was something that I truly loved, that I wanted to just, just do that and not get hurt. And, uh, you know, so that was kind of the, after my junior year, you know, I just concentrated on, on basketball. And because, and because, you know, in the spring and, you know, basketball just consumed everything that I did <laughs> um, from time to my mind to, to all of that. At what point in your playing career in high school did you start thinking about playing college basketball? Was that something that was always on your mind from the time you were younger? Was it something that snuck up on you? Just describe a little bit about how you got to the point where you thought, hey, I'm going to have a chance to play college basketball. And then we could talk a little bit about your recruiting process and what that was like for you. Yeah, you know, it, it's funny because kids nowadays just talk about hooping. You know, all I care about is just hooping. And that's what I thought about. I, I you know, my I had brothers, my brothers and sisters, they went to college. And my oldest sister went on to, to you know, she played three sports in college. Um, I didn't think about college in the sense of going there to play. I loved watching the game. I, I remember watching a lot of the NCAA tournament and the high school state tournament and, and all that stuff. Um, and my dad used to always take me to the NAIA tournament in Kansas City, which was great because he got me out of school <laughs> to be able to do that. With, with <laughs> double, per dub yeah. double perks, man. That, Ab that absolutely. Absolutely. But, you know, it really snuck up on me because I, I had a pretty good summer after my junior year. So I had, you know, going into my senior year, I had a pretty good summer. And then I started getting mail. Then I started getting phone calls. And the crazy thing is that these AAU tournaments, coaches were 
in the lobbies of the hotels we were at. So, so then you start <laughs> thinking like something's going on. And I had, I had pretty good teammates as well in AAU. You know, I had guys that ended up going to KU and Missouri and, and uh, some really good, some really good schools playing basketball. And uh, so then it, it really j- just, uh, it caught me at that point. And, uh, but and again, I was just still hooping and playing and, and loving the game. And not thinking of it as, man, now you need to get serious about where you want to go and what you want to do uh, from that standpoint. Because, I, I mean, I just thought high school would go on forever from that standpoint and, <laughs> and never thought about it, you know, time eclipsing. Was there somebody that, that helped you through that recruiting process, high school coach, your parents, AAU coach? Because I know at that time, there just wasn't, you know, you think about the amount of information now that's available to kids just in terms of the internet and just being able to talk to people. And I think that high school coaches and AAU coaches are a lot more well-versed on just what goes on in terms of recruiting today. But I think back in the era when you and I were coming up, it wasn't as prevalent. So do you remember, how, who'd you get advice from? Or do you remember trying to navigate the process and what that was like? You know, to be honest with you, um, and it's crazy that a lot of people would say that I was wise beyond my years. And, and I was really quiet about the entire process. I loved it. You know, my high school coach was, was really good about it, you know, because he had coached guys that had played at Kansas and, you know, guys that had gone to, you know, different junior college programs. So he understood the, the recruiting process. And my brothers and sisters were, were recruited, but probably for me, too young to really even care at that point what was going on. But my high school coach, when I was going through everything, uh, he was he was always in my ear. He was always talking to me about the things that you need to work on. And he he would always tell me and my mom would say the same thing is, you know, things happen for a reason. Your time is going to come. And I, I think he just let me enjoy the process more than anything and just fielded all the stuff and shielded me from, you know, all the recruiting stuff as well. And. So if a coach came in to see me, he wouldn't even tell me that a, that a coach was coming in to see me. He just expected, hey, he just expected me and, and kind of knew my personality that I would work hard no matter what. And, but my high school coach, Larry Hogan, was, was really essential in, in helping me through this process. And, uh, you know, I had some, some schools recruiting me during the, the fall. Right now, kids are committing, you know, before their junior their junior year sometimes or before their senior year. And uh, I waited until, you know, mid January to commit. So, um, so for me, it was, he just made sure that I stayed humble, that I continued to work. And, you know, when it came down to, you know, decisions that I had to make and schools I had to to look at, uh, he was counseling me at that point. So obviously you end up at Northwestern, but what was the, decision-making process that landed you there as opposed to somewhere else? Do you remember who your final couple schools were and then ultimately what pushed the decision over the top to make it Northwestern? Yeah, you know, the, the funny thing is um, when, I was, when I was at a five-star basketball camp, I went there for two out of three years in my high school career in, in Pennsylvania. And, you know, at that point, all the best would go there if it's not Nike. Uh, the Nike camp at that time, but but a lot of really good players would go there. I remember being at the camp and and uh, Grant Hill was there, Sean Bradley, uh, you know, a lot of really good players doing that that were my age that were at that camp. So the reason why I'm bringing that camp up is there was one of the counselors was Ramil Robinson from from Michigan, and I could just remember like looking at him like man his 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 body. <laughs> you know, he's, he's about my size, about six two. He was strong. He was physical, and I, you know, and then ultimately I saw him in the NCAA tournament and in the Final Four in the championship game and making those free throws. The free throws, yep, yep. Yeah, against Seton Hall, and so when I started thinking about college basketball and 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 not necessarily programs, I started thinking about leagues. What league is he in? He's in the Big Ten, and. And I was a physical guard and a lot of people were telling me about the Big Ten and how physical it was and and seeing the Michigans and the uh, Illini and 
you know, all those schools, obviously Indiana, uh, seeing those schools, it was an extremely physical league. And I just said, you know what, that, that fits who I was at the time. And, and uh, you know, so the Big Eight was right. I, I lived about 20 minutes from, from KU. So, you know, they were recruiting me. Missouri was recruiting me. They were in the Big Eight at, the, at that time, now the Big 12. And, uh, you know, so that kind of was the, the list of, of schools that I had. But the Big Ten was what really intrigued me. And, and then the other side of that was, uh, you know, when Northwestern came in, my dad started talking to me about life after basketball and what that would mean for me. And, and uh, you know, but I was telling him, like, Dad, hold on. I'm, I'm thinking about winning. I'm thinking about I'm thinking about Kansas and Missouri and, and UConn was recruiting me at the time as well. Those were kind of the, the last four. And and he was like, son, he said, don't he said, don't don't worry about all that stuff. And then my mindset started getting to the point where I was thinking I've always had a chip on my shoulder and I, I still do to this day. And so at that point, I started thinking, you know, what Northwestern hasn't they had, you know, hadn't done much. They hadn't won. You know, they had a really good player, Rex Walters, and some other good guys. I thought I could come in and and be a part of. And I just said, you know what? I want to be part of that first group that took this team, you know, someplace that that won there. And I wanted my name to be a part of history from that standpoint. And uh, so that's what got me to Northwestern. In 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 uh, in, in in addition to the academic. Uh, part of it that that uh, really paved my way for my future. Yeah, I'm sure your dad had some conversations with you about the academics at Northwestern at some point. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> he did. All right, so what did the summer look like between your senior year of high school and your freshman year at Northwestern for you in terms of getting yourself prepared? What do you remember about that summer? And then what was your biggest adjustment going into college, both from a social academic standpoint and then basketball-wise? Yeah, you know, I thought, um, you know, my my summer going or the spring summer going into, you know, before my freshman year, I was maniacal about my my workouts and, and what I did. And and uh, so there were some all star games in between there. Uh, also, our senior group, which was pretty good. I, you know, I told you we had some guys that from my AAU team, they played for Kansas and Missouri and some other programs. Um, you know, we played against the, at that point, it was the Soviet Union in uh, our in an all-star game at Kemper arena in Kansas city where the Kings used to play. So that was the, the highlight of my summer, but I was maniacal in my workouts. You know, I lifted so much and in preparation, I ran, I did all of that stuff knowing that, you know, I would have an opportunity to, you know, to play and, and hopefully make a difference. And the biggest, so that wasn't going to be the basketball side wasn't going to be the greatest challenge for me. The the social and the academic side was going to be the the greatest challenge. Um, as much as I thought that I was smart, <laughs> I found out that there were <laughs> there were people like twenty times, thirty times smarter than I was. So that was a huge adjustment to me in the competition in the classroom as well. The social aspect, I all I cared about was was basketball. You know, so there wasn't. For me, there wasn't a lot of going out and doing all that stuff, and 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 I was almost socially and awkward or awkward because it was basketball and sports, and that's that's what I lived. That's what that what that's what my life was. And I had my friends in college and all that stuff, and still had some good times with them. But I wasn't used to, hey, you have two or three classes a day, your workouts, and then you have some. Some social. I wasn't used to some social time. I wasn't used to that, and uh, so the biggest thing was the social and academic uh, transition for me, which was the most difficult part, and adjusting to that. But the basketball, you know, I was I was ready to go, and it and it actually hurt me as far as getting too big, and because I, you know, I had gone from shooting about forty five percent from the three in high school and really struggling uh, to shoot the basketball and finding my rhythm. Uh, my first year, even though I, I started every single game. Yeah, I think that it speaks a lot in terms of when you talk about that adjustment period uh, from a social standpoint. And I think a lot of guys are, are similar to you in that, you know, you have this sort of maniacal focus on on basketball. And, and I think when you're in your sort of high school bubble, you can do that. And your 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 family Your family obviously supports that. And then you get to the case where, 
you know, you're in college and sort of that freedom opens up and you kind of got to figure it out. And there's an adjustment for everybody when you get through that. And it sounds like from a basketball standpoint, you were obviously clearly ready to go right from the get-go. So when you think about your career at Northwestern, give me a couple things. One, give me a highlight or two that stands out for you. And then obviously you played against some tremendous players, some players that have gone on to become rather famous and were famous while they were in their school. So talk a little bit about just the best guy or two, the three that you played against and give us some highlights of uh, some things that you remember specifically about your career at Northwestern. Yeah, I could go on for days talking about the the best guys. <laughs> I'm <laughs> but, sure that's, that's a long yeah, list. You want to yeah. give me the top 25? <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll do that. We'll, we'll do that. Uh, you know, <laughs> you know, first of all, the, the highlight was um, my first big 10 game. And yeah, there were some non-conference games that, that we played and, and, and was able to to do that but my first big 10 game was against purdue and you know at the at the time you know they had uh scheffler i don't remember know if you remember him he was a steve, big lefty big, big steve big steve scheffler absolutely yeah he uh, was six nine and probably 900 pounds and but built like granite and uh and, and then you know they had they had some they had uh, Woody Austin uh, they had some really good players and that was my first big 10 game against a in an, an elite program or, or a very good program that, that was built on toughness and, and all of that and and uh, so that was a highlight the first big 10 game and then you know the the last highlight or the second highlight that was that was good uh, that I remember to this day was my last game regular season game as a senior in college and Michigan came in. That was our last game. I think it was March 3rd or something like that. They had come in and, and uh, you know, they didn't have Chris Weber at the time. He had already declared for the NBA draft. But they had Jawan Howard. They had Jalen Rose. And then they had Jimmy King and Ray Jackson still. And they needed that game to win the Big Ten outright. And uh, we needed that game to give us any hope of playing in any sort of tournament. So, you know, it was the NCAA t- tournament or NIT. There wasn't a CBI, CSI, and and uh, all of that stuff. So we ended up playing them to overtime and then eventually beating them in overtime. And I think I had 20 and 9 or 10 in that game and, and played really well and, and kind of cemented, um, you know, kind of closed a chapter from us from that standpoint of uh, my Big Ten career playing against uh, Michigan. So th- those two were the greatest highlights for me from a basketball standpoint. Um, and then if I start thinking about the the, the greatest players that I played against, uh, two guys, actually three guys really stand out to me. Um, one was, uh, you know, one was Jim Jackson. You know, he was 6'6", six, 6'7", six, six, really tough, strong, and he played the, the point guard position. and But he could play all over the court. But so, just so tough and strong, uh, I'll, I'll give you a fourth one too. And then Steve Smith at Michigan State at 6'8", he played the point for them and was really good. And then the last two, you know, uh, Calvert Chaney, I'll tell you a story about guarding Calvert Chaney. So we're going into Indiana. He's trying to, he was however many points from, you know, getting the, becoming the all-time leading scorer in Indiana history. And so Coach Foster, Bill Foster, came to me and he said, all right, we're going to play a, a box and one. And I was like, okay, good. And I, and I, <laughs> and I said, so who, who's guarding Calvert? <laughs> so he, he said, you are. Nice, uh, there you go. So then I get there, and I, you know, I'm not afraid of anybody. So I get there and I find out that he has to get to a certain number of points. I think it was 35 or 36 to get to uh, his whatever the total was, the all-time uh, scoring total was. They set every single screen imaginable <laughs> for him to get open. I'm bouncing off of, uh, I'm bouncing off these guys and and getting screen left and right. He ended up getting it, and uh, I talked to him about about it to this day because he had been in the coaching profession for a little bit um, in college and. Uh, he was the hard, one of the hardest persons that I had to guard. And then the last one was Glenn Big Dog Robinson uh, that played at Purdue. Um, just at, at six eight, just could do so many different things, but just tough and athletic. And, you know, he beat us the first game of my senior year uh, in the Big Ten on a back, kind of a behind the backboard shot, kind of like Bird did, but it didn't go over the top. 
uh, with three hands in his face, and that that was the game winner to beat us by one. And uh, but I also played with him in the U.S. Olympic Festival uh, going into my sophomore year. He was going into his freshman year, and it was great playing with him because um, it made my job easier. Just pass it to the best players. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt so about those, no doubt about that. No doubt about that. He's yeah. a guy who I think you look at his. You know, you look at his NBA career, and obviously he had a good NBA career, but I think if you'd have said coming out of college what he was going to be in the pros, uh, I think he probably didn't achieve the heights that maybe he expected. I think that other people expected when you thought about how dominant he was as a college, you know, as a college player at Purdue. He was just, I mean, he was incredible. Oh, he, he was unbelievable, and he had a stretch where when he was playing against Kansas, you know, he had a big-time game against them, and dunked on Greg Ostertag. Ostertag gave him five. I know some of Ostertag's teammates at this point were sick to death when he gave uh, when he gave Big Dog five after that dunk <laughs> <laughs> on him. And then Duke, he played against Grant Hill in that uh, Elite Eight. Uh, that was a, a great game as well. But he, he was a tremendous player. That's awesome. So I have actually have I have two good stories for you related to two of the four guys that you that you talked about. So Jimmy Jackson is an Ohio guy. Yeah. And when I was in high school – uh, my dad and I went uh, to a, to a local high school here that Jimmy Jackson's team, with Toledo McCumber, came into uh, yeah. and played here, uh, close to us, probably about a half hour away. And so I had never seen Jimmy Jackson; just had heard, you know, you heard you hear the stories, but you had never seen him. And he was in tenth grade at the time. And my dad and I went, you know, you're just in a little high school gym, and you know, we got there early, and you're sitting in the bleachers watching the JV game, and you know, you're wondering, all right, are we going to be able to know who this guy is, you know, when he comes out, you know, let's try to identify, you know, we didn't have the roster. And so, you know, he comes running out and clearly, obviously, <laughs> immediately, you know, you see, you're like, yeah, I think we know which one Jimmy Jackson is because he was, he was built the way he was as an NBA player. He was built that way when he was a 10th grader in yeah. in high school. I mean, he just was, again, it was like watching, it was like watching a man playing among, among boys. Uh, so I was always a fan of him just because I kind of got on him early and, and knew a little bit about him back when back in those days. And then my Steve Smith story. So when I was at Kent my freshman year, which was 88, 89, uh, I didn't play very much that year, uh, but played a little bit. But we made it to the NIT and we played against Michigan State. So that was the year Steve Smith was a sophomore. And so we kind of had a, a bench crew at the end of uh, at the end of our bench. Our, our freshman class that year had seven kids. And so there was one who played a lot, and then there was a couple that myself, another guy that played, I don't know, we might have played six or eight minutes a game, something like that. Uh, but my one teammate went in in the last, we lost that game, and uh, he went, he checked in in the last, I don't know, we maybe went in the last minute and a half or so, and for some reason Steve Smith was still in the game. But my friend was guarding Steve Smith and was picking him up like at half court, and yeah. Smith Smith threw the threw the Smitty move at him, the half, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. you know, the half reverse, and my friend fell down, and <laughs> <laughs> and so for for the remainder of his career, uh, that was continuously brought up that Steve Smith made him made him fall down with the with what ended up being obviously his signature move. If you if you anybody out there, if you search Steve Smith highlights, you're going to see. 40, 40 of those little hesitation reverse, you know, reverse exactly. fake reverse pivot moves. That was his, that was his move. And man, that guy was, he was good. He was a very, 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 very good player. So, yeah, no all doubt. right, let's go to, uh, obviously you want to keep playing when you get done. So talk about the perfect, when you started thinking about playing professional basketball, what the process was like, and then we could talk a little bit about your experiences overseas. Yeah. You know, when I, uh, graduated and you know my career was over at Northwestern from a basketball standpoint uh, you know I started working out and doing all that stuff and and it was probably a long shot at that point uh, for the NBA although you know I still was thinking about it I mean I who wouldn't and uh, you know so I, I get an agent I go through that process um, and I, I think like a lot of kids and maybe I was just so naive I'm sitting watching a draft and and <laughs> the point zero 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 one percent that my name is called <laughs> you know oh yeah um, <laughs> but uh so after that you know i i you know my agent and i would talk and then i go through the summer and work out and and uh you know was in uh you know was in la for the for the summer league and at that point it was you know there was going to be a lockout you know prior to you know prior to that season being over in the nba so you know 
there were some there were some guys that that were playing in that that you know had been in the NBA but now still trying to get back in. So you know they were in the LA summer league and and I played and and uh, you know it was it was good. And then I had a uh, after that you know was able to get to the CBA um, and you know with the at the time it was called the Hartford Hellcats and then uh, they changed to the Connecticut Pride. Paul Mokeski was the was the coach. Um, so that was a, a short stint and, you know, came back after that and uh, uh, worked for a little bit, came back to Kansas, but worked for a little bit, worked at Converse, um, did all that stuff because I knew I still wanted to play. So I didn't want to get a, a job that kind of restricted me from being able to just break off and, and do what I wanted to do. And uh, so after that, I, I you know, continued to work. And then there was this uh, developmental league. I don't know if you, it, it was probably the worst league I've ever joined. <laughs> <laughs> but I went down to uh, Augusta, Georgia. There were some good players in it, though. Um, you know, I was at, a, it was called, the team was called Augusta Drive. Um, I think it was called the ABL, American Basketball League. And uh, so I was in Augusta. We played teams from North Carolina and Alabama. And, uh, you know, some really talented players. Uh, from my, I even had teammates that I competed against in the Big Ten on the team. Uh, a couple guys, that, <laughs> excuse me, that were from uh, Arkansas at the time uh, had been on, were on that team. So it was a, kind of a good concept, but just didn't have the money in order to survive. So the league folded. I said, I'm, I'm, I'm tired of the rat race at that point. And, you know, I had a couple of nagging injuries and then just decided to work for three years. You know, I got a job at Dean Foods Company in Chicago as a you know, first assistant marketing manager, and then as a business analyst and did that for three years. But I still had the bug to play. There was a gym right next door to that's probably the worst thing that ever happened to my company <laughs> is there being a gym right next door because, you know, I would get all my work done, what I needed to do, calls and formulas and all that stuff I needed to <laughs> complete uh, prior to midday. I would where's, where's, pa- where's Pat? Where's exactly. Pat? <laughs> exactly. I would skip lunch. I would skip lunch in order to just to play and lift and do all that stuff. And because uh, I had gained a few pounds, but because of that gym, I, I had knocked off, you know, I, I got back to, to playing weight and I was just there all the time. And after work, you know, I was there for about an hour, then would drive home and, and, uh, so got back in shape and then there was an opportunity in Elmhurst. There was a, there was a, a, a camp for guys that wanted to try to see if they can get overseas. So there was a lot of international uh, representatives from general managers to scouts and all of that stuff. And, you know, I was MVP of this camp. And from that point got on to, uh, you know, it was a team called Aaron at you know, in, uh, in Bosnia, Herzegovina, near, right near, it's right on the border of Croatia. So, um, so I, I ended up signing with them, which was amazing. I, I didn't know what to expect. And obviously I think everybody knows about what was going on in the war at that point, uh, in that area. And I almost didn't care. Just get me over there let me play. Let me get a feel for it. And, uh, they assured me that there were no issues anymore. And um, so had a great year there. And then, you know, the following year went to Zadar in Croatia, you know, where Dino Raja played and, you know, some really big time players. And and he was from there uh, where they played. It was it was the the greatest experience of my life from a basketball standpoint. I mean, I can talk about all the high school and, and college stuff. But when you start putting things in perspective and and what playing in Europe and playing in that town and for me kind of historical perspectives that was the greatest greatest place and time of my life uh my wife and i absolutely enjoyed it uh, we totally immersed ourselves in their culture uh, you know i learned a language a little bit i'm not going to sit here and tell you i know the language but <laughs> you know learned the language um uh just still have friends to this day from that time and still communicate with them and uh if my knees and everything else held up, I, I still would have would have been there. But I stopped playing too because of uh, not nine eleven, you know. So that I, I had a contract to to sign in Italy the following year, um, but nine eleven hit in that September, I believe, obviously, and uh, decided not to put my family or my wife's family through that. 
Yeah, that was a tough, that was a tough decision, I'm sure, to make, you know, with, when you had, especially sounds like with the great experience that you had uh, to, you know, to be able to shut that down and not, and not go back. So I have to ask you, which I ask to anybody who's played overseas, you have to have, everybody has a crazy European overseas basketball story. So what's the, <laughs> what's the craziest, what's the craziest story that you can tell on air uh, for the time that you were over there? Because everybody, ha everybody has one. <laughs> well, this is this is a really funny one. Hopefully, no one from uh, from Bosnia is listening. <laughs> but but uh, the owner for that team was it was reported that he had stolen money from banks and was this big time mafia guy. And I had no idea, but it was it was reported. And so the whole time I'm just let me just do my job and if he needed me to score 20 i'm scoring 20 because that was the funny thing is <laughs> is i love to pass and give up the ball and then my coach came to me and, and the owner was he the coach was uh you know he was uh he was talking english while the owner was talking in, in uh, croatian and all i heard my coach say was patrick we didn't bring you here to pass we bring you here <laughs> to score and I said, that's all I needed to know. So, uh, so I, you know, I went in and started, you know, started scoring and, and that was my job, you know, got MVPs in some of these tournaments that we were doing there. But as the story goes, uh, so I started knowing that about the owner and even the players started saying that, that he even shot his cousin, you know, over <laughs> some money. And the so funny you better, thing you better, you better, you better be scoring then. It, absolutely. So his cousin even still worked for him um, at that time after he was shot. <laughs> so, uh, so then, so he had a boat, he had a boat along the Adriatic sea and, and all that stuff. And there was one weekend that he asked my wife and I to go out on the boat with him. And so in the back of my mind, I'm thinking there is absolutely no way that I'm going on this boat <laughs> with this, you better have a big guy. game he right knows. before you go, right? Don't score two points the game before you go. Exactly, because I don't know, I don't know what his intentions are, what he's going to do to me, and and all that stuff. And I respectfully declined. And uh, you know, who knows? You know, <laughs> who knows what would happen if I'd have gone on that boat? Uh, so that was that was kind of the the crazy story. That's uh, good. That's that a point. good. That's a good one, man. I love it. Every everybody has everybody has one that are they're just it, it's amazing just how kind of goofy situations can be over there for sure. Coaches, we've teamed up with Coach Tyler Whitcomb so you can now purchase his exclusive new playbooks right from the Hoop Heads Pod website. If you're looking for ways to improve your team next season, these playbooks blend affordability with the quality content that serious coaches are looking for. Just visit hoopheadspod.com slash store and you'll find playbooks from John Calipari of Kentucky, Leonard Hamilton from Florida State, and Mike Young of Virginia Tech. Check out these great resources at hoopheadspod.com slash store. So all this being said and going through your playing career and everything, at no point during this discussion have we talked at all about coaching. So you, it seems like you were focused on continuing to be a player. And had you thought about coaching at any point while you were playing? Or was it now here you get done and you're looking around, you're like, I don't know if I want to go back to the business world. I want to stay involved in the game. Let's give coaching a try. Or was coaching kind of always in the back of your head? Just explain how you, how you came to the coaching profession after your playing career ended. Well, I'll tell you this, that when I was in high school, I thought about coaching. One of my favorite coaches to watch was George, uh, John Thompson at Georgetown. I always loved their team. I even wanted to go to Georgetown. Um, I'll tell you a funny story about that. You know, I'm being recruited and only place at the point at the time I wanted to go to is Georgetown. So I come home from school and my mom tells me I got a, a letter from Georgetown. As soon as she said I was at the door, I sprinted from the front door to where she kept the mail. I opened it up. I'm so excited. I'm thinking I'm getting something from, from, from John Thompson. It ended up being an admissions letter. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, so I'm so disappointed. And, and to this point, I hate Georgetown because of that. That's but, funny. Uh, That's funny. But the funny thing is when I, 
you know, I told you about my time at Dean Foods. I liked working in the in the business world and doing all that stuff. I didn't love it. You know, I, I didn't have the passion for it that I do for basketball and sports. And so in talking to my wife, you know, the thing that she taught, just do something that you love, that you love to do. And and I just felt from that point in talking with her that after I'm done playing, that I'm going to try to find something in coaching. So that was my plan from once I played, getting that out of my system. And then once I was done to go into into coaching and, and uh, you know, trying to be the best coach I could be. So when you first get into coaching, you get your first job as an assistant at Lincoln. What does that, what's your first uh, introduction to coaching like? What do you remember about it? What was something that maybe surprised you about coaching that you didn't realize when you were on the playing side of it? Yeah, and it's funny, you know, so after 9-11 hit, I, I had to think right away. I'm not going back over there to play. So, um, so I'm scrambling now and trying to, and I, we, we saved a little bit of money and stuff like that, but so I'm trying to figure out what I needed to do and where I, what I wanted to do. And so um, uh, Bill Pope, who's now a scout with the Kings, you know, he, he was the head coach at Lincoln. So I get over there, talk with him. You know, he convinces me that, that this is an opportunity to get started and it's a division two job. So the first thing that kind of woke me up to, to college basketball and first memories was I'm doing everything, you know, and <laughs> I'm, I'm doing the laundry, I'm handling some academic stuff. I'm doing recruiting. I'm sweeping the floors. I'm doing drills. I'm on the phone, you know, so I, I'm, I was like, you know, what CEOs talk about, you better understand every single part about this business um, or else you'll, you'll fail. So, you know, that was the thing that I remember just, just doing everything and but at the and I didn't think about was this a problem I just think about this is what's expected and this is what I should do and what I wanted to do uh, so that was the kind of the first introduction that this is is it's more than full time you know it, it's a it's a 24 7 deal you know from from start to finish did you realize that as a player I mean do you did you think if you think back to, let's just go with your, your time at Northwestern, did you think about your coaches at that time having to do all those administrative and other things that, were un, you know, that weren't related to basketball? Because I think of myself as a player, and I think back to my time in college, and I really, you know, again, coaches show up at practice, they're at the games, they're on the bus, but you don't think about all the time that they're putting in with all these uh, non-basketball related activities and that was the thing that once you get into coaching that I think you don't appreciate as a player the amount of time that your coaches put in outside of the time on the practice floor and at the actual games I had no idea you know when I was playing at Northwestern and all the things the head coach and the assistant coach did I had no idea uh, what they had gone through and and uh, the knuckleheads they had to deal with, like me, um, <laughs> you know, coming, <laughs> coming, coming through. Um, so I mean, it was, you know, it was, it was an eye-opening experience, but it wasn't something that I was afraid of, because I, I've always felt that I had a tremendous work ethic in, in uh, whatever it is, whether it was playing, um, whether it was school, all that stuff. I, I just wanted to do my job and do it to the best of my ability. And, but when I found out that this is what it takes, I was like, God bless every single one of these coaches <laughs> that, that coach out there, because, you know, there's so much of a commitment to it from the, the things that, that, uh, happen with being away from your family about, uh, you know, all the little things that you don't see, you know, dealing with, you know, some of these student athletes and, and sometimes what they go through, um, the media, all that stuff, you don't recognize and you don't see as a player. And you just see the surface stuff. But when you definitely dive and and get underneath the surface of everything, uh, there, there's so much in this world that, that would blow people away. Yeah, no question about that. Let's talk. I know I'm kind of jumping ahead here, but I think you just brought it up. And I think it's a, a relevant question that coaches out there, I think all coaches – I don't know if struggle with this is the right word, but have to figure out. And you talked a little bit about your family, and I know you have four kids and a wife, and you're obviously running 
the head of a Division One program. So talk a little bit about how you tried to strike a balance between your ambition as it relates to being a basketball coach and what you your, what your responsibilities are and what you want to be able to do at home with your family. Just talk a little bit about how you handle that particular part of the job. You know, I, I think it's, you know, in the very beginning, it, it's difficult. And, and I'll say this, anybody who gets their, their first opportunity as a head coach, you think about the number one thing that you think about is, how can I be successful in this place that I'm at? Because I don't know if I'll get another chance. So that, that's one of the first things that you think about. And if you're worth anything, or if you really are conscious about that stuff, you try to do everything within your power to make sure you, you do everything right. So, um, and you try to, you want to win, you want to win. So you're going to exhaust yourself, you know, so the things that I, I'm sure other head coaches or guys in my position have done is that first or second that those first two years you're just really you're just running nonstop. you're constantly at the office you're constantly on the phone you're constantly thinking about your program and unfortunately at, at some point you know it's, and, and it's not something that's conscious it's it's unconscious you do this is sometimes you you forget about the most important people and things in your life. And, and a lot of that is your, your family because, because of all the sacrifices you're trying to make for your program, you know, you sacrifice your family a lot. And, you know, that's the, that's the hardest thing that you go through as a, as a head coach. And, and hopefully you have an extremely supportive family that when you're going through that grind and you're trying to do well and, and you're going to have ups and downs. And even on my worst nights, I, I think my my kids, they run for the hills after a loss <laughs> or something like that, you know, uh, because they, they know I'm not in a bad mood. But they also know how much I put into it that uh, you, you just you just hope that they have so much strength and and resilience to be able to, to withstand all the pressures that come with it and the time away and all that stuff, because it's it's tough and. But I think as you start getting a staff, I'm going into my fourth year. And so the, I think what you start doing is you start really putting things in, in a greater perspective and uh, what really matters. You know, hopefully you have your program where it's almost, it's never going to be running itself, but you hope you're in a situation where things are balanced and you know that certain people that you can trust within your team they're taking care of that for you and you're delegating the right things into the right people. And so now you can step back and you can concentrate uh, doing a little bit more, uh, you know, with your family. And I think if I'm just looking at our profession, this was a blessing in disguise. Not that I want anybody to die or have coronavirus, uh, but this was a blessing in disguise to make all of us as coaches realize what's really important in, the, in our lives and in this world. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Pat. And that's one of the things that when I've talked to just my friends in my normal life and then other people that we've had on the podcast since this thing has kind of started, I think most of us who are, are trying to take that perspective that you just shared, which is it's a chance to step back and reevaluate where your priorities are. It's a chance to step back and look at what your life is. It's a chance even more importantly, probably to, to spend more time with your family than anybody has, you know, any right to expect to be able to spend when you're in your day-to-day -day job and everything else. It just becomes such a challenge to, to carve out time when you're, again, when you're ambitious and you have things that you want to, when you want to achieve in your job, whether you're a coach or whether you're not a coach, uh, you know, if you're an ambitious person, you tend to you tend to focus on those types of things. And sometimes, as you said, you get caught up and you forget about where the really important things are, which is, you know, which is at home, which is why, again, we all do the things we do because we love them and we're passionate about them. But we also do them with the idea in the back of our head that we're there to be able to support and, and raise our family. And that's really what it's all about. And I think you're right that, you know, again, it has been a blessing in that way that it, it's it slowed people down and caused them to to sort of reevaluate themselves and hopefully when we come out of this uh, eventually that 
that change in perspective will continue to to stick with us so that we can continue to make good decisions and be able to you know be able to strike that balance and so when i think about what you just said uh, one of the things that i heard you talk about there was you know getting the program where not where it's running itself but where you have the right people in place and you've been able to establish things now and you're in your fourth year and you have things uh, again, under control, maybe the right, maybe the wrong word, but you, you kind of have a system. Your systems are in place. You know what you want to do. You know how you want to how you want to do it. So if you think back to your time from starting out as an assistant to Lincoln, and then you went to a, a few other stops as an assistant coach, what are some of the things you learned along the way as an assistant coach that helped you when you eventually got the head job at UW Milwaukee? Well, you know, I think. Um... You know, one of the biggest things that that I learned um, in all my time as an assistant coach and um, was trying to be the best assistant coach possible. So our head coach didn't have to do as much. You know, I, I, I gradually picked all that up when I first started at Lincoln and then at Green Bay and then at Loyola, Missouri State and Northwestern. But when I first started out, I don't know if I really had that down. And although my intentions were were great. You know, I had, um, all I was really trying to do is cement myself and make, I was trying to make the the head coach happy, but I was in, in a little bit of a way I was selfish in the way that I was thinking. Um, and that wasn't a great thing. And, uh, you know, I, I quickly, you know, had the perspective and changed that and selfish in the way that I wanted to input you know, I wanted to to put my imprint and 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 even as a player, I always wanted to. What can I do to help? What can I do to help? <laughs> but I became so selfish in that in that respect that sometimes it, it came off as either not listening or arrogant or or something like that. And I did that was not my intention. Um, but I got better. You know, after my you know third year of coaching, I mean, I learned to be even more you know, uh, reliant on my other assistant coaches that, that were with me and being great, being a great teammate to the assistant coach and then being a great um, steward for the head coach. And, and that was his program and, and starting to think about if I ran this program, how would I want, how would I want this to be? So I started putting my mind in, into our head coach's uh, mind and, uh, and and stepping in his shoes a little bit, and you know, it, I think it it became even better for me because I I started becoming so much more unselfish um, in the respect of of what I thought about, and it wasn't just about getting the guy that I liked; it was getting the 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 guy that you know the coach that the head coach wanted and liked and and felt like he could win with, and and this is what his thoughts were, and um, so as I look at myself as a head coach now. Um, you know, I'm very confident that, that I have guys on here that, that have been in the profession, you know, long enough that they know that, you know, there's certain things that I like and dislike and, and they know how to fan those flames or put it out quickly uh, before I have to get to it. So, you know, the delegation part of it is is easy. The, you know, I can relinquish some of the control. I am a control freak from that standpoint. I think a lot of head coaches are. But you just really have to have uh, your coaches that are beside you that uh, that uh, can help you with that because because um, you want everything to be right. Yeah, absolutely. I think it, as as the head coach, I think one of the hardest things, and I can speak to this just in my own life, whether it comes to coaching or it comes to a basketball camp business or a podcast or whatever. I tend to be a control freak, and I tend to want things done a certain way. And then I think the danger, and it's kind of what you were alluding to is the danger if you're not willing to delegate and put people in places that they can utilize their strengths and help you to, you know, get the things done that you need to get done. You end up in that situation we were talking about before, where you're just running around crazy doing, trying to do everything. And then you're sacrificing a little bit of yourself and you just can't, you just can't get everything done if you can't delegate. And when you have good people that are part of your staff, you want to be able to take advantage of the things that they do well and you want them to be able to help you. That's why they're there. And sometimes, again, as you said, it's difficult to do that because you want to have control. You want to be able to 
put your imprint, you, you believe in yourself and what you're capable of doing. And so I think that that is, I'm sure, a process. And it's not, it sounds like it was a process for you. And I know it's an, it's an ongoing process for me and probably for a lot of other coaches is to, to be able to sort of surrender some of that uh, authority, some of that control to someone else to be able to say, hey, you got to take this part of it or you're going to do this part of it. And ultimately that makes <clears throat> that makes everybody stronger. And I think that's what it sounds like you're trying to do there at UW-Milwaukee. So talk a little bit about when you first got the job. What were some things that, you know, obviously you had never been a head coach before. So you come in. What were some things that you thought, if we're going to build this program and get it to where I want it to be, these are some things that I have to put in place in order for the program to get to where I want it to get to. Do you remember what your your first priority or two were when you first got the job? Well, I think, you know, anytime that uh, you get a head job and this, obviously you talked about it, that it was my first time getting this opportunity. You know, I had a lot of great people that, uh, you know, that I worked with that gave me a tremendous amount of advice. You know, I can talk about from the time at, you know, Lincoln to Green Bay and Loyola, Missouri State and, and uh, uh, you know, at Northwestern, there were tremendous people. And, and I would say, you know, the first thing that they talked about, and, and we kind of mentioned it was getting great assistant coaches uh, that were in a line that were in alignment with what your goals are and how you want it to be and how you wanted the program to to look and you know so once you establish those things and you have those guys uh, that will work hard for you and, and do whatever you, it, it could to they could to, to get it done uh, you know then you had to establish your culture and how you want it to be but that takes that takes time and you have to build trust with with your players and and who you already have in you know that was going to be the most difficult thing is you know you're going into a place where someone else had recruited these kids that were in there and and then you don't they don't trust you and that's not it's nothing against the person who was hired in there it's just a, a natural instinct of kids to to wait a minute, I don't know you. I don't know what you're about. I don't know if you re really care about me. So they innately don't trust you. So you have to build that trust and, and all of that. And um, and then, you know, Jim Phillips, who's the AD at Northwestern, he would always tell me is, is it's not going to happen overnight. You have to, you have to build from, you know, the foundation, you have to start with the foundation and you have to trust um, that it's going to, you know, periodically get done and, and in the right way. And, uh, you know, so that's followed, that's followed me. And then, you know, I had a great model of, of where, you know, the last, my last stop of, and even prior to that, we, we built every place I've been, we, we've had to build and we had to kind of bring it up from the rubble a little bit. So, you know, from, from that standpoint, I had a great lesson of, how do you take things from the very bottom and try to build and you don't do it by skipping steps. And I think that was the greatest lesson that anybody's ever told me And our AD consistently, or my former AD at Northwestern, who, who he consistently tells me, don't skip steps, Patrick, don't, don't skip steps. My AD now, Amanda Braun, she says the same thing is, you know, we're, we're not skipping any steps, continue to do the right thing with the things with this program and things are going to work out and, and she trusts, you know, that uh, we are, you know, going about it the right way. So what does that look like when you say don't skip steps? What are some steps that in your mind are things that you're trying to do, things that you've already done that are leading you to the success that you eventually want to have? You know, I think when we, I think every coach who gets in this profession, they think about winning. And so when you think about winning, you think about how can I get there as quickly as I possibly can? Because everybody's a competitor and you want to win at all costs sometimes. Uh, but sometimes, you know, we've we've seen it that a lot of coaches will sacrifice themselves and sacrifice their souls for a, a win or for the best player in the world and and all that stuff. And and that's what I think that's what it looks like. Um, you know, the other side of that is when you when you're not skipping steps, you're um, you know, you're just saying, you know what, a loss may not seem like, may seem like a loss to somebody else, but that, you know, maybe that loss may be a win depending upon how you played and what your goals are. 
uh, for each game that you go into or each step from recruiting to the process and all that stuff. And, and uh, I'll, you know, sometimes, you know, in skipping steps, you'll say, you know what, in order to win, I'll, I'll get the, I'll get a jerk as a player or I'll, but he can play. And, but I, you know, I almost kind of put my, my program, set my program ablaze because I've tried to get the best player that's not a true fit for your program. And, you know, so I'm reminded of that constantly to, it may not look pretty from the very beginning. Um, you know, if, if you don't get that best player or you pass on a really good talent in order to sacrifice the, the culture of your, of your team and program, uh, but eventually it'll pay off for you. And I, I'm a true believer that eventually it's going to pay off for us. And, and skipping steps also is, is, you know, or not skipping steps is making sure that uh, when you're building the right way, you're building with, with kids that, you know, have a, you know, a singular focus of, of, I want to do the right thing. I want to get a great education. I want to perform well. I want to do all this stuff from a basketball standpoint. And, you know, you're not going, you're going to be an everyday type of person an everyday type of team and everyday, uh, you know, type of program, all that stuff. And, and, uh, you know, so that's what it means to me. And that's what it looks like. And um, I, I think we're going about the right way. The wins hadn't come the way that, and as quickly as we wanted to, you know, it looked that way in my first year when we went from, you know, the team had gone from eight wins the previous year before I got, got there to 16. So I'm thinking, I know it's not easy, but we're <laughs> we're going in the right direction. Right. Some say you don't want to win too early, <laughs> or else you create uh, unrealistic, uh, uh, you know, things from that standpoint. But uh, but we we had a lot of wins this year, despite you know some losses. You know, and and people don't understand that, but our program we do. All right, talk a little bit about what it takes to build the kind of culture that you want to build and then just describe for us what the culture of your program is all about. Maybe give us some pillars, give us some, some words that you guys use within your program to with yourself to say, Hey, this is the kind of program that we are. Just talk about the culture that you're trying to build there. Yeah. You know, I think the first part of your culture is the people that, that are in it and, you know, first it starts at the top with, with our AD and, and our administration. And then it starts with our, our coaches. If, if you don't have a buy-in, if you don't have the, the people that really believe in, in what you're doing, then that's going to erode over a period of time. But I believe that we have that, you know, I think we have committed coaches and then it comes, you know, other, other part is the other people are the, the players. Um, yeah. I, and I think everybody knows this. You have to get very good kids, uh, that are committed to that in, that are committed to everything that's involved in the program that are committed to doing a great job academically that don't miss classes that don't um, you know don't get in trouble they don't embarrass their family or friends or, or any, anyone in that university uh, that they're committed to working hard they, they want to get their bodies right they treat their bodies right um, so so from the coaches to the players, you know, you really have to be committed to that. And, and you have to be honest with yourself too. You know, the thing that we have to do as coaches is we have to make sure that if there aren't people and coaches or players that aren't committed to doing the right things and committed to being everyday guys, then that can't be a part of your program because ultimately they're going to get to somebody on that, you know, on that team. And when you have, one guy that isn't committed and then they infiltrate someone else's mind and, and all that stuff, then there's two and then two could lead the four. And then there goes your, you know, your program and the, and the things that you want to do the right way. Um, you know, so that's, you know, kind of encapsulates, you know, what that looks like is it, it first starts with the people, you know, that you bring in. And then it just starts with, uh, you know, from the, the, the mentality that you have uh, with, with, those people in there. And I want, I want anybody looking at our program that, that says, you know what, that's a tough minded team. That's a tough minded program. They do things the right way. Uh, you almost have to kill them to beat them. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I just want to, to have that, that tough mindset 
um, if, if you're looking at if you're looking at my team and and that's what I think that we're built on and that's what I think our culture is and and some people say um, you know it's you know it's a grind it is a grind you know it, you're going nine or you're basically you're you're almost 12 year 12 months out of the year doing things and and uh, competing and getting yourself ready you know for the the grind of a however five or six month period and uh you know you have to you have to enjoy the grind you know you have to embrace that and you know if you have guys that don't embrace it you know then you're going to be in trouble you know i saw a tweet from a young man then and i get it you know kids are you know they're anxious right now they're trying to go through they're going through so much this is unusual for them they can't uh you know they've never gone through anything like this before and it's still adversity and we're trying to coach them and teach them on how to to handle this and be and have a great perspective about it but the tweet said is um you know all of, and this is about recruiting all the stuff going on i'm sick of you know coronavirus which is accurate in, in a fact everybody is i'm sick of the way that we have to do things now and uh you know all this you know phone calls and virtual stuff that that and meeting with coaches i'm sick of this crap and from one standpoint i look at it and say you know what i am too <laughs> you know what i mean <laughs> right i am right. too I'd, I'd rather be in front of you and and trying to to help you and really let you see the campus and meet our guys and all that stuff but then i stepped back and i said what if you know what if I give you a scouting report. You have to play against the best team in the world or best team in your league. And you have that scouting report and you say you're sick of this. What if you miss a line and you have to run it again and, and then you stop running because you say you're sick of this? What if after a hard practice, you have to go into the weight room and you have to lift after that? What if after, you know, you the lift and now you have to do your treatment and then from your treatment, you have to eat and then you have to you know, go to study table. And then you say, I'm sick of all of this. You know, so I looked at that and said, you know what, this is not my type of kid and could have been a good kid. Maybe he's just sick of it. But I want somebody saying, you know what, we're dealing, you know, we have to go through this. I have to embrace, embrace it for what it is. And, and I'm ready to attack it. I, I'd rather see somebody like that. And maybe I'm making a poor judgment on a kid based off of that. But, you know, it's little things like that, that, uh, make me pause and realize let's make sure you do all your homework on on every single kid I, I think we made the right decision well i heard you say a couple times use the term an everyday guy is that a term that you use with your players and whether you do or you don't just define that in your mind because i think that's something that encapsulates a lot of what many coaches want in their culture they want everyday guys so just talk a little bit about what that means to you yeah, and, and I definitely will. The, kind of the phrases we use are everyday guys and working until and, and build brick by brick. Uh, but everyday guys to me are, you know, similar to, you know, what I just talked about is, is you're going to have great days, you're going to have bad days, you're going to have days in between. But that that doesn't change how you are. You're going to get up in the morning every single day, you're going to have a positive attitude about attacking your classes making all your classes on time, seeing your academic advisors, being, you know, having a great spirit, coming to the weights, being ready to, to build your body up. Um, it's practice. Maybe you're, you're down in energy, but, but I'm going to find it some way, somehow to be a great teammate, have a great practice, lift somebody else up. We always talk about filling somebody else's cup. We talk about afterwards um, of, of doing the right things, you know, so it's, it's every day and it's kind of the it, it's not the right term but insanity <laughs> you know it's and you talked about you know the groundhog's day you gotta you gotta want to do this every single day no matter the no matter the, the grind no matter whether it's successful or you know there have been some setbacks you have to want to do this every single day and i think that the more everyday guys that you have in your program the more success that you have. And, and, you know, I think we're slowly getting to that point where we have a lot of everyday guys and everyday coaches too. All right. So follow up with that. You obviously want every guy on your team, on your roster to be an everyday guy. And yet, you know, during the season, 
there's going to be guys on the end of your bench who don't play as much as they want to play, or there's going to be guys who don't have the role that they want. So just talk a little bit about how you keep the guys at the back end of your roster engaged throughout the season, because I know that's something that you think about as a coach, and a lot of times as coaches, we end up spending a lot of our time with thinking about the guys who are at the end of our roster and making sure that they're engaged, that we're keeping them a part of the team. So just talk a little bit about how you go about doing that and keeping those guys at the back end of the roster engaged and keeping them as everyday guys. Yeah, that's that's really tough and, and tricky. And, you know, the thing that I, you know, really from the very beginning is I talk about and we had up on our board uh, every single meeting that we have is we have our standards and and uh, our mission statement and what that and what that means and the things that are on that standard board center of excellence board is trust and accountability and so when you have guys at the end of your bench and there's no question they want to play they want to try to to help you succeed and and i hope they're that they're wanting to let me play hard and beat this guy out in practice so I get an opportunity. And that's what I'm looking for. Um, but the, the first part of that is just the trust is when I talk with each and every one of them individually and as a group, I tell them the truth. I tell them where they're at and we talk about their roles um, on this team based upon summer and fall and then i and then we talk about you know where we feel like uh their role is on our team and i think if we talk it talk about it from that standpoint you start building trust with them and i do it in front of you know i've talked to them about it individually but i do our roles in front of everybody i talk about them individually in front of everybody from where they're at so that even the guys that that may get the 30 minutes per game they understand where this young man is at and what he's done and and i can corroborate with my best player and he can say yeah i, I see why he's not playing <laughs> you know what i mean um and so if, if we can build that trust and they know that that i have their best interest at, at heart and that we have our open door me they can come in at any point and talk and and i'm not afraid to, to telling our guys the truth and they know that and they know where I stand. Um, then the second part is the accountability of it is if they're accountable and that's where you get the everyday guys, everyday guys are going to be accountable for themselves. Um, if they see on a stat sheet that they may not be producing like somebody else that's playing a lot, then there's the accountability. Like, wait a minute, this guy's produced in practice and in games and, and I've had my chance and I'm not there yet. So, so we had guys like that that came up to me and told me that, like, Coach, I want to get to where he's at. I know where I'm at right now, though. Can you work with me? Can I come in and watch film? Can we stay after practice and work on this single aspect in the game or from the practice? And so that's where kids, they start being accountable. And I, I thought we had that with some of our guys who were on the bench this year. And and then it's it, it, it's the love, you know. Our guys from one, we had 18 guys. We had five walk or three walk-ons, four walk-ons. But our guys at the end of the bench, they were so ecstatic for the success of their teammates because they loved each other. So that's what kept them going, in my opinion. It wasn't anything I did or said, but but because they – hung out together, they they were at their apartments or dorms, they they did everything together. They talked about this being the best team that they've ever been, been a part of from that standpoint. Because they loved each other, it, it made them work harder because you don't want to let that person down um, when you're going into practice. Um, and and our guys who were who were players, you know, who played a lot, they would get on our, you know, guys if they felt like, you know, those guys that were 10 through 13 or 14 on the on a depth chart they would get on those guys if they didn't feel like they were bringing it and so that's you know that's where i think you get to them if you have that that trust and that accountability part and that love for each other uh your guys that don't play as much you know yeah they want to win they want to compete and they want to be out there 
but they'll they'll buy in, you know, to a certain extent. You know what I mean? Absolutely. I think that sounds like a fun team to coach. Yeah, it it was. And, you know, we didn't get like I told you, we didn't have the wins, but that's why I'm telling you that I thought we win. We won without the wins um, in, in some of our losses because we had great teammates. They love being around each other. And, you know, at times, though, they, they realize I have to step it up and we'll tell them that. And and I'm I'll always be honest with my guys from that standpoint and, and be truthful. Like, yeah, he's you know, he's scoring 16 for a reason. And I'm giving him, you know, the ball. I'm putting the ball in his hands for a reason because I trust that. You know, I trust him. And I want to you know, we had a couple guys this year that I told them in front of everybody is I'm looking at you every single day in practice. I'm watching you two every single. I know what these guys can do. I'm watching you every single day in practice because I'm hoping that you can give us, you know, a stretch of three or four minutes of great basketball, you know, when we call your name. But if I don't see that in practice where you're going through a, you know, anything competitive in practice and it's a three or four minute segment and that you don't give me, that you don't produce or give everything that you have in that three or four minute segment, then how can your teammates trust you when they come out of the game to give you that same thing or give them that same thing. Yeah. You have to, I think, again, it goes back to what you said about accountability and making sure that you're handling what it is that you need to do as a player. And I think oftentimes, you know, you'll hear players that will grumble about opportunities and are not getting an opportunity in a game. And I think what players sometimes forget is that in practice, you're getting plenty of opportunities to be able to, demonstrate and show what you're what you're doing and coaches are clearly paying attention to that in, in the practice setting and cut off a little bit I think it's important for players to understand that you're being evaluated every single day every single moment with and on, on everything it could be culture piece it could be your performance on the floor like you said we might only need three minutes from you out of this game but that could be the difference between a win and a loss that three minutes and I got to be able to trust just like you talked about trust in other ways you know yeah I got to be able to trust if I put you on the floor that your performance is going to live up to what we need in order for us to be to be successful. We're coming close here, Pat, to uh, an hour and a half. I got one more question for you, actually a two-parter. So my last question is, when you think about your, your years here at UW-Milwaukee, what has been your biggest challenge in the job? And then let's end on a high note with what's your biggest joy when you wake up every day in the morning What's your biggest joy about being the head coach at the University of uh, Wisconsin-Milwaukee? Well, the biggest challenge is, um, and that's a great question, but the biggest challenge is when we develop any of our players and they're really good um, and they're young and or you redshirt guys believing that, that uh, man, their best basketball is ahead. Um, and then – kids decide that they want to transfer. You know, that's the biggest challenge because um, nowadays you're not, it, it's almost as if you're not preparing them for their four years. It's almost like there at your program, it's like you're preparing them for what could be their next stop. So if you're really <laughs> doing a great job in, in uh, developing kids, and that's the way it was our first year, you know, they had, you know, we had an eight plus win um, margin from, before I got there to the, to the year, the time I got there. And so kids are thinking, well, shoot, <laughs> you know, we had, we had more success than we did the previous year. My numbers went up and I got greater opportunities. I have this, this film in front of me now that I can show somebody else. And now let me go see if, you know, if, if I can do this at the highest level. And so in this day and age where, you know, there's a, a lot of transfers and, and for whatever reason, uh, that's the greatest challenge of, of really building your program and trying to build it with those four year guys that you can keep and not have to worry about if they're being poached by, you know, other programs and in particular high major programs. Um, you know, that's it, it, you know, now they're talking about with the, uh, the one-time transfer rule coming out, that's going to be even a greater challenge because now if a kid, if you develop them, he hasn't left yet and he's doing well in school and he's doing well in your program, he can leave at any point. Yeah, that's, cra that's, to, cr that, 
that's crazy. Weird. It really is crazy. I mean, when you think about it from a mid major standpoint, I mean that rule that rule is a potential. I would think from a mid major perspective, a, a potential disaster. Yeah, no, it is, and that's what that's what all of us are afraid of. And and there's there's seemingly no control on that at this point, and and we almost have to. And I I believe in a kid having the right if they're being abused or mistreated or something like that to, you know, find a, a different avenue, a different place. But um, if there's nothing like that going on and kid just wants to to leave just because they, you know, score 15 points per game for you and they have two years of eligibility, you know, there's nothing then that we're going to be able to do. You know, we can't yeah. control that. Uh, so that's a challenge. Um, and then the, the greatest joy is just, when I wake up every single day, knowing that there's a great opportunity in front of us to, you know, to get our guys better, to, um, you know, get with my staff and talk about our strategies, how we move forward with our team, um, with recruiting, all of that just gives me so much joy. And, and then I always, you know, I, I always think to where we can be, you know, so when, March hits next year, will we be in a position where we can say, you know, we're either dancing, winning our league or getting, you know, have to, you know, what do we need to do to continuously improve? That just brings me joy. And then the ultimate joy is the guys that you coach and that you mentor, that you see them graduate. And uh, that that's our role as a coach is, yeah, yeah, our role and, and we need to win. We want to win. Um, but we're trying to help young men go from whatever, whatever time we get them from 18 to, you know, 23 or 24 years of age. Our role is to make sure that they grow up, they become, you know, quality young men and that they graduate and, you know, be able to do something with their degree and, and be impactful in their lives. Pat, that is fantastic stuff. Uh, it's been a pleasure getting a chance to talk to you this morning for almost an hour and a half. Before we get out, I want to give you a chance to share where people can connect with you and connect with your program, uh, give them a way to to find out more about what you have going at UW-Milwaukee, and then I'll jump back in and wrap up the episode. Yeah, you know, it's I really appreciate you allowing me to, to get on with you and, and had a had a great time. If you wanted to, if you want to connect with me and if you have any questions or anything pertaining to my program, you know, my email address is, is baldwinp at uwm.edu. And I'm constantly, you know, on Twitter as well, probably to the, to the detriment of my family. But uh, <laughs> my Twitter account is at Coach Baldwin23. And, uh, you know, I'm constantly looking at that stuff, but that's a way that you connect as well. And, um, and then our website is uh, mkepanthers.com. And uh, if you want to find out anything that's going on within our program. So, but I, I'm extremely grateful for the opportunity to come on with you and, and, uh, you know, share this hour and a half and, and talk hoops. There's, there's nothing greater than that. Couldn't agree more. Pat, can't thank you enough for spending the time with us this morning and to everyone out there, we will catch you on our next episode. Thanks. Registration is now open at headstartbasketball.com for this summer's Head Start Basketball Camps. We'll be hosting camps for boys and girls in grades 1 through 6 throughout the greater Cleveland area. Get registered today and make sure you hit the courts with us this summer. Hey everyone, last year at the Junior NBA Summit I came across an amazing company called iSport360 and its founder Ian Goldberg. Their youth sports app gets coaches, players, and parents on the same page. Your team can set goals, share player feedback, training videos, sticker rewards, player evals, and practice assignments. All of this to foster a healthy team communication and culture. If your team or club struggles to keep open lines of communication, especially among team parents, iSport360 can help. If you want to empower your athletes to have more success, more confidence, and more communication with their teammates, give iSport360 a try today. Shoot me an email, mike at hoopheadspod.com, or give me a call at 216-392-4059 to learn more. Being without basketball right now is tough for all of us. 
So we've partnered with Pro Skills Basketball to offer you a 50% discount on their ultimate shooting guide and video program that will put players on a guided path to becoming the best shooter they can be. With one year's worth of workouts that includes games, drills, and competitions, players will gain access to a blueprint showing them what it takes to become an elite level shooter. If you're looking to improve your shooting at home, this program can help. Visit hoopheadspod.com slash store to check it out. Thanks for listening to the Hoopheads podcast presented by Head Start Basketball.